politics, nothing happens by accident. If it does, you can bet it was planned that way. Good evening and welcome. This is Face the Nation. Nice to be back in the studios after a lapse of nearly a month. It's always good to be hosting Sri Lanka's only English language political talk show. Is Sri Lanka in a limbo? Last week we saw gas prices going high, a record high. We saw the Sri Lankan rupee against the US dollar reaching 163 rupees. Timetable of the local polls seem to be shifting time to time. This is because the local government minister himself who brought in the delimitation report opposing his own report in parliament just last week and there's only five more months to go for the president to constitutionally call for a presidential election if needed where is Sri Lanka heading in the next five months to discuss all this and more tonight on the show we've invited uh, four guests to our studios as usual joining us uh, this evening on the show is uh, Mr. Kesar Rao Gunasekara Four member of parliament, also uh, a councillor of the Devon Mount Lemina Municipal Council. All joining us tonight on the show is um, Mr. Rusri Parthenakon, senior banker and municipal councillor of Colombo. Joining also uh, us on the show tonight is Dr. Harun Yamar Surya, senior lecturer at the Open University. Joining us this evening on the show tonight is also attorney at law Krishmal Varasurya, council and national convener of the Rata Sulekimu movement. Nice to have. All four of you in our studios this evening. Let's start off tonight's show with uh, Mr. Rusiri Parathendakon, Senior Banker and Municipal Councillor of Colombo. Mr. Thendakon, now you are a part of uh, the Sri Lanka Freedom Party and one of your own ministers who brought in the delimitation report um, just a few months ago opposes his own report in Parliament. Let's not talk about the UNP, let's not talk about the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, let's not talk about the UPFA, let's not talk about the joint opposition, let's not talk about all these members in parliament. Let's just talk about the minister himself. His own report, he opposes it in parliament. Why? Yes. I think I, I also listened to his part of it because he was defending it by saying that it is not his report, but it is the report of the commission that he... Uh, I mean, he was part and parcel in appointing. So, uh, I don't know, but that doesn't absolve him from, him from the responsibility and the role that he has to play as the minister in charge of local government and uh, to find a solution or to bring a... Uh, to, to uh, have these elections without any further delay. Mm. There is a role that he has to positively play, not by not merely saying that you know, it's not my commission, my report, somebody else's report. But what has happened is pathetic. If you if you recall, this whole thing started from the time this uh, amendment to the Provincial Councils Act was brought up. I don't know, I saw it at that time. There were some aberrations in this act. Now they are going to, we are seriously reflecting those now because here is a situation where there is a provision in this act which says, if the parliament does not approve the commission report by a two-thirds majority, it will have to be referred to a committee headed by the prime minister. Now, I was wondering whether the supremacy of parliament is maintained with that thing. If the parliament of the country rejects a thing, mm. disapproves a thing, how can a five-member committee headed by the Prime Minister, have the final say on that. From that point onwards, I was sort of bewildered to find out why, why was this done? Why was this provision introduced? And the President gazettes it. What is this law? Where is the supremacy of the people? I think the flouting of the right of the people and the, uh, the, 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 the people's uh, right to, you know, to, to maintain their uh, the, the voting rights and elect their own representatives was disturbed and flouted at that point. So now what the minister does is, 
the commission submits a report, a delimitation report, which is not, I don't know whether anybody debated it. Even without debating, they rejected it. Uh, Mr. Nikon, uh, the Sri Lanka Freedom Party and the United National Party, it is a well-known secret, were locking horns on most of the issues uh, that came to the table. However, when it comes to the postponing of the local government election, both parties are united. Isn't that a little bit strange? That's a survival game that they have to play it at any cost. Mr. Nikona, you can't absolve yourself from this equation as well. No, you but I'm just, just a small Lanka appendage in it. Well. I'm just a small appendage in it. I do, I'm not a decision maker in any of these places. I have to talk the truth. Wherever I belong to, I have not stepped into one party or group just to say yes to everything that they say. I, I hold my right to express my views independent. Were you among the members who walked out of the Kalama Municipal Council sessions when your mayor proposed that uh, the uh, salary revision to the members uh, in the council? No, I don't, believe, I don't believe in walking out. I stayed back, opposed it and voted against it. I spoke against it. I and another member, a few others from the from JVP, I should mention, they spoke against uh, uh, the the move to increase the allowances of the municipal members. I also spoke against it, and I voted against it. I don't believe in walking out. That is evasive tactics. But you just did that a couple of seconds ago when I asked you about the UNP and the SLFP. You just very very slightly. Uh, had a grin on your face and said, um, I'm just a very small member in the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, didn't you? And you did, uh, no, did, I still did duck that, that question. I still, <laughs> maintain, I still maintain that. But nevertheless, I decided to speak out and give my views straightforward. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Spalthanikon, senior banker. However, now is the uh, a member of the Kalam Municipal Council. So unfortunately or fortunately, we can pose some questions to him about the Sri Lanka Freedom Party and its conduct. Uh, I now move my attention to Dr. Harini Amarsurya, Senior Lecturer uh, at the Open University. Uh, Dr. Amarsurya, the events that have unfolded in Sri Lanka over the last uh, few weeks, uh, let's take a look at uh, the gas prices going up. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the Sri Lankan rupee against the US dollar, hitting a record high of 163 rupees. Look into all this, one thing is evident, no one wants an election anytime soon. Is it or is it not? Seems like it. Uh, and, and where do we stand in this whole equation right now? What can the people expect from our politicians, from the legislature? What can we expect from them? Can we expect anything from them? Not much. I don't think we can expect. Uh, I think when I was here the last time also you asked me a similar question. And I said at that point that this is going to be a lame duck government for the next couple of years. And I think that's what I can say right now as well. So I think, I don't think we can expect much change or any, any expectations of uh, any radical reforms or anything in the next couple of years because now uh, this government is in a position where um, it's looking, it has to face the elections at some point. And it's doing its best, I think, to postpone that moment as far as possible. Until that moment comes, they'll sort of, you know, just sort of try to survive. They're in survival mode. So they're not, that's not, I don't think we can expect very much. Five months from now, the president constitutionally can call uh, for a presidential poll. Would this be on the cards in the next few months? Can we expect a presidential poll at least? I doubt it very much. Do you think the government is losing ground in the mindset of the people? I think the government started losing ground perhaps six months into their, uh, to, into their victory in 2015. Uh, I think they started losing ground when they weakened the 19th Amendment. That was, I think, the beginning of the end. Uh, and I think ever since they've been losing ground and have never really gained ground. But we see, we see projects like the uh, Gamperalia movement, uh, which uh, is going to cost millions of uh, rupees of the taxpayer. We see um, many other initiatives being uh, brought forward by the government, uh, envisioning an election in the next few months as well. Do you think all this will work? No, I mean, 
this this is all very sort of tired and very repetitive no i mean once again we are kind of we seem to be our governments our politicians seem to believe in only one model and that is sort of doing these flashy projects and imagining that people will uh, be enamored of these kinds of uh, fancy I don't know, sort of you know uh, projects that they throw around and that that's what is going to bring about change but that's not why this government was elected this government was not elected because of Gamper earlier this government was not elected because of the megapolitan I don't think these little sort of gimmicks that they are throwing out at us right now is really going to do much in, in, in uh, gaining the ground, ground that they've lost. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Harini Amalsuri, Senior Lecturer at the Open University. I now move my attention to Mr. K. Sralal Gunasekara, uh, former Member of Parliament, also a member of the Devil Mount Lavinia Municipal Council representing the Sri Lanka Freedom Party. Mr. Gunasekara, what is happening right now? Are you not disappointed with your own party? Are you not? Are you not disappointed with your own party? Well, uh, it's very difficult to answer a question. I am disappointed. Uh, uh, to be very frank, I am disappointed. But at the same time, there are certain good things also that have happened. Tell us a little bit about the good things that this government has done want to hear your side of the story. Well, part of the 19th Amendment of the Constitution brought in so many uh, good uh, uh, measures, proposals, which I felt was taken away from by the 18th Amendment of the Constitution. That was a good sign, that, that was in the correct direction. But as to whether they could have, uh, be, they could have uh, done better, uh, stabilize their situation, was a question, was, there is a question mark. As to whether they have, uh, uh, run the economy in the manner it should have been run, that's a question mark once back again. But where did the we government started losing ground? Pardon? Where did the government start really losing ground, uh, Mr. Gunasegara? Well, the question is, I, I feel that uh, economic management is crucial because unless you have good economic management, you have a problem. But at the same time, in fairness to the government, I must say this as well, that uh, they have had a serious problem with regard to uh, the weather and as a result uh, uh, so many uh, food crops are affected not for not for one once but twice in certain occasions in Mr. certain areas so therefore in that context we have a situation where the government has to look into those as well because it's the farmer who is being uh, uh, who, who has to be protected. Unless you protect the farmer, the majority of those people will uh, rebel against the government. And I don't think that has happened. That is number one. Economic management, no, because I feel uh, six months uh, down the line, we were told that there was so much excess liquidity in the, in, in the market. You have excess liquidity means very simple question. There's nobody invested investing in uh, projects. That's not a good sign at all. And uh, if money is not invested in projects, you hardly have uh, uh, employment generation. No, I saw problems. To, let's talk a little bit about uh, the previous government, uh, Mr. Gunasekar. You were also part of this government, and you were the deputy mayor of the Devil Mount Municipal Council. And during this period, you know that in your locality, there were 30 um, illegal constructions and and uh, the mayor at that time had given approval for all these 30 uh, illegal constructions as well and there is a petition which is now under review as well. Uh, my question to you is, even at that time, nothing concrete happened. Has the situation at least changed now or is it the same? Well, it, it all depends on the mayor. It all depends on the mayor. Two, three areas is ethical behavior, financial discipline, and three, as to whether he's, he's really involved and he knows what governance is all about. Now, you just now asked a question about the uh, Colombo municipality. Very clear signal, no? No knowledge of governance. Very simple. 
and the knowledge of governance. And the Human Mountain Municipal Council is quite good in, the, in, in those terms. I, do, I don't say that, but then comparatively, relatively, we are far more better. Far more better. better. But as I, as I told during, you, during it's, a, it's, a, it's a mayor. 30 legal mayor. constructions, Mr. Gunasekara, when you were the deputy mayor yeah, yeah, of, yeah, yeah, of yeah. they will mount the municipal council. Yeah. Don't forget that I was, as deputy mayor, I raised matters with the UDA, but the UDA did not take any action. I raised matters. Did you raise the matters with the government of the, the mayor, Dhanasari Amartunga? Of, of course. And what did he say? I mean, uh, the law is very simple. Huh? Hmm. The law states very clearly that the power is vested with the, with the mayor with regard to building applications, not the council. Huh? Not the council. Therefore, he is free to do what he wants. It's the same with all councils. Huh? Not only the Hill Mountain, yeah, Colombo, all over. Unless you have ethical operation taking place, unless you are disciplined, and number three, unless you are aware of what municipal governance is, these things will continue to happen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kesar Agunasekar, a former member of parliament, also a uh, councillor at the Devil Mount Kavinian Municipal Council. I now move my attention to uh, Attorney at Law, Krishmal Varansuriya, a council and national convener of the Rata Surikina movement. Um, Krishmal, now you've heard uh, two SLF peers um, uh, and one civil rights activist uh, voicing their concerns about the country's future, the country's economy, and where we are really heading right now. Can more be done or this is the end of the road for this government? Your time starts now. Thank you, Samir, once again. Uh, thank, thanks to you and your station for inviting us after a while um, to your discussion. Uh, and uh, generally, uh, I am at a loss, Shamir, to understand. I too joined the masses as to how or what we need to put in place to change this system. But I am not at all negative about it because we can't. At least the faithful few must keep fighting on so that at least when we close our eyes, uh, we can, as uh, President Kennedy said, uh, well, we've tried to make a change. We may not have got anywhere, but we've tried and, and uh, die happy in that, in that sense. But I think the problem lies, Shamir, because not with the politicians. I'm not saying that they are not the, they are very much the problem, but with the people. But not for lack of understanding, I don't blame them for it because no one has attempted to educate the masses on what a republic or building a republic or running a country really is. We need to now think out of the box. As long as you look at individuals or parties or this name or that name to, to help us solve our problems, we are not going to get anywhere. We need to strengthen institutions. This is a large subject. I can't deal with it in three minutes, but maybe we can discuss it later in a question time. But we need to look at a system where people won't be subservient dependent upon, as someone, you mentioned Gamperalia. Whether you call it Gamperalia or Samurdi or Janasavi or whatever it is, consequent governments come and call it, we are still giving a fish but not the fishing rod to the people. We want the people to be subservient to some sochang that falls from our pocket so that the people will continue to rally around us, get on the buses, come for the Arak bottle, come for the bath packet to go for the rallies. So that is why we want to give some Samperalia to keep them a. You vote for me, I look after you. Now we need to get into a system where people don't care who comes because the systems are in place, a policy is in place. So whichever joker that comes from A, B or C, that may even include me as a joker, I'm, I'm calling myself a joker also, whichever joker that comes into office, he has no option but to walk the line, do what the system requires him to do. And if he puts falls out of place, the system will look after that problem. That now look at the, uh, give me 30, I have 30 seconds. That share, that 240,000 rupee share. Now we are living in a country where 640,000 rupee share, that into 125, uh, it comes to millions. And apparently some of them have even gone on a familiarization to Belgium to look at the share. 
right? And and we are living in a country where people are just sitting and taking this. I mean, they they on one side, mother mother is jumping into the uh, into the lake with a child because she can't afford to give a, not even a packet of milk. That little lank, uh, I don't want to mention the name, <laughs> the sachet, the five rupee sachet she can't buy. On the other side, we are saying six hundred forty thousand rupees for one chair into one hundred twenty five chairs plus a plane ticket to up and down and hotels to go and look at the chair. I told that when some one of your stations asked me for a, a voice cut, as you all do, on and off from us, I said, well, you know, if they had got into a bus, got a number hundred bus, gone to Morotu, other place called Morotu Mulder Road, we have, you know, like that Freddie Silla song says, Arunge Mali Barun Morotu E Daksavadua, so many people would have taken a picture out of the internet and made much better chairs there for maybe, you know, 25,000 rupees. So um, we are living in a country where we are, we are becoming a joke. And and therefore, uh, I think I'm not running out of time. I think we need to look at a, a complete overall of the system as to how we do it. I have certain ideas. I'm sure all of us have. We we can discuss that later. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Krishna Varanasuri, Council and National Convener of the Rajasthan Civil Movement. Uh, Mr. Varanasuri is also an attorney at law. Uh, let me open the floor for questions from our journalist. Uh, onto my immediate uh, left is Charita Fernando, and onto my far left is Nadi Majid. Uh, Sharda Fernando's last uh, episode as a full timer at MTV, or? I hope, <laughs> I hope she's back too. So, yes, Sharda, let's uh, start the flow with you. Thank you, Shamir. Uh, my first question is to Mr. Varun Surya. Now, uh, as panelists here said, and so many others have repeatedly uh, spoken about at this forum, uh, the Yahapalane government came in uh, promising good governance reform agenda, putting systems in place. Now we saw the delimination uh, report being defeated, right? So three months down the line, uh, we were thinking that, okay, elections are in the pipeline, so the government will be in an election mode. What mode is the government in right now? Charita, my question to you is, do you have a government? For me, Simple understanding of executive government or parliamentary systems or Westminster systems that we have studied at basic levels, at A-levels and universities is made a mockery out of what we have. An executive government cannot have an executive minister voting against the same policy that the government brings to parliament. In other countries, they resign if power fails in a ministry under, under their care. And then we don't have an opposition. And this entire question, in fact, I had the opportunity recently to discuss the matter with the Honourable Speaker at, at a social forum, not, not professionally. But this entire thing, or even the opposition, I don't think we have an opposition in Parliament. Because it is not a matter only for the Speaker to decide based on the number of heads in Parliament. We, now we've gone beyond that. We have 70... have a parliamentary supremacy in this country. That's in England. In our country, the constitution is supreme. And all three organs of government are sublime to that, are subservient to that. The constitution is supreme and the other three organs are, are, are operate on equal terms. Neither is superior nor inferior to the other. So, if the people's sovereign power is not expressed properly in our house of legislature, that's not a matter for the speaker to decide. I mean, there's a constitution question arises. And that, in all probability, there is precedent. Uh, the, the people's judicial power, the Supreme Court, must decide on this question. But go, do, not going that far. So I'm saying we don't have an opposition. And we don't have a government because the so-called national government in terms of constitution is not a national government. Because there is only part of a part of a party now. Earlier it was part of a party. One part went, the other part became opposition. Now out of that part, also some 16 or 17, they are fighting for the number. They have also left now. So they are part of a part of a party. And that is in terms of constitution, not a national government. So we don't have a government. We don't have proper opposition and we don't have proper executive system of government. So what's the government? Uh, the delay that is caused by the by this report, either we'll have to go for a fresh uh, report uh, or the uh, elections will be delayed no, for Rusin the... What is are, correct. No, what are, is the, correct. what are the consequences? No, exactly. Uh, that, that this, is, this, is, this is why, no, we, we argue this provincial council in the Supreme Court. No, After we argued it, if I remember correctly, Rusin, they went back at the committee state, they made several other amendments, which were never, never before the Supreme Court. When we argue the constitutionality of this bill and it was sent to the committee uh, with the suggestions that were made by the, the Lordship of the Supreme Court, that was then made, said to be made law. Then they went to some committee stage and made several other amendments. And that is once again a violation of the people's sovereign power. 
So Not just they went to the committee stage and they added another bill to it. Yes. That's what I'm trying to say. In violation of the standing orders of parliament. Yes, so but Nadim, my question is now here we are taking red herrings now. Yes. I at some time think whether they are actually putting this before us for us to argue about this like this on shows so that they can go on with their merry governing and their morning trips and their nightclub uh, uh, reveling to till morning. You know, I wonder whether they are actually doing that. Because <coughs> this is, we are now digressing by discussing point by point of the provincial council bill or the statement or the affidavit or 118 names on list or something. We are not discussing the problem. The problem is nothing when though they made those amendments at committee state and they put in an entirely new uh, thing into that uh, draft. What are the people doing about it? I am asking your viewers, at least uh, the English speaking viewer, uh, actually our mainstream stations in Singhal and Tamil should be asking these questions. But now that we are speaking in English. But in such a situation, what can the people do against it? The Supreme Court can't rule uh, well, against the Supreme Court. There is nothing to say that the Supreme Court can't do anything, nothing. In my opinion, we are not using the just and equitable jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, which is extraordinary. It's a constitutional jurisdiction where a person, a citizen, feels their fundamental rights have been infringed. But Mr. Arasuri, many constitutional lawyers will disagree that... No, please, we'll no, no, please that let that me finish my answer. Is, Otherwise, the people get only half my answer. This country is ruled by, as I said, a, a constitution that is supreme. That constitution says when a person's fundamental rights are infringed, they can go to the Supreme Court and ask for determination. That jurisdiction is a just and equitable jurisdiction. That's not bound by a civil procedure court or a criminal procedure court. It's not bound by a court. Their lordships can do whatever, give whatever orders. It's as wide as that, that they feel are just and equitable. So these are the times that we must go and try to agitate the powers of the Supreme Court and say my rights have been infringed. Mr. Nikon, uh, on the 5th of September uh, this year, there is a protest organized by the joint opposition on the present activities of uh, the Hapane government. And on the same day, the present government is proposing to have a meeting about the progress that they've made during the last four years. And this was decided upon uh, at a meeting that was chaired by President Maitri Palasiri Sena and Prime Minister Ranil Vikram Singh. The proposal was made by Sajid Premadasa. And they are to bring in uh, members of the public uh, to their respective ministries and discuss about the progress that they've made. Who will win the battle? This is the politics that we are used <laughs> to in this country. But, but who will win the battle now? Unfortunately, it's quite interesting. Uh, a protest see, and then to discuss about the progress uh, that the Hapal government has made. I think, the, I think made. the protesters will be more, to be very fair. Because the mentality of the people you know, rather than going and praising something or accepting something or saying good about something, the numbers who will like to talk bad about things will be much more. That's the normal tendency. So therefore, there will be protesters in numbers. We have seen these numbers. We have seen golfers rallies. We have seen May Day rallies. We have seen all these I'm things. I'm beginning to think, uh, Mr. Nukon, for some, some reason, that you're in the wrong camp. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, I don't think so. I'm in, the, I'm in the correct camp. You're in the right camp and doing what? Yeah, I'm doing the right thing as well because we have to move with the with current uh, trends, you know. Um, uh, so you're, Nico, you're, the, the, you're in the right camp time. site but you're the only person in your tent. <laughs> no, <they're not. laughs> Because I think you, you say you're the only one others to follow up, <laughs> and you say you're the only one who opposed uh, the move to increase salaries of, um, of uh, municipal councillors. No, no, two, camp. two of us, two of us from our party, we spoke against, okay. and we voted against. Me and another member. Are you sure? Are you sure you're in the right camp, Mr. Nagar? Well, what, what you're, makes you're you contemplating? I'm trying what, to figure what out. What makes you think that I'm in the wrong camp? Because you say <laughs> that the protest march on the 5th of September will garner more support. And then you say the, the proposal made by your president, the chairman of the Sri Lanka Freedom Party, will not bear fruit. This is a show of strength, Shamir, you know, by how you mobilize. The people. I but, want to, I, I, but from the point of view of the show, it will certainly be a show. Right. So I want, I want, I want to put the same so, question so to Dr. Uh, Harini Amrasuria. It's going to be a show on the 5th of September. Do you think it's going to be a show alone or is it going to be the will of the people that you will see on the 5th of September? No, I, I think it will be a show. It will be a huge performance. And I'm pretty sure there will be a, it will be a fantastic performance. I have no doubt about that. Uh, electorally, let's not forget that there is still a, a 
certain percentage of people who uh, voted cons quite consistently with the joint opposition and who they represent. And so they will be able to mobilize. And I mean, and, and, and I think the point here is that they have been very effectively, rightly or wrongly, mobilizing people over the last several years. Ever, uh, they were, you know, I think for the last two years or so, they've been very effectively mobilizing people. They've been taking their message through to the people very effectively. The government has not yes, done that. The yeah. government because, has well, failed in doing that. Dr. Amosul, I'm posing this question to you because of a reason. We saw. Uh, recently at a media conference a powerful uh, member of the joint opposition stating that uh, the 5th of September should be declared as a public holiday because um, a lot of people won't be able to be uh, won't be able to mobilize themselves to go to the offices or whatsoever but the qu real question is why are they even using a weekday to launch a protest isn't it no, I mean, I think that they have every right to protest on any day that they want. I mean, that's part of a demo demo de democracy. But I think it's ludicrous that they should expect a national holiday to be declared in order to protest. <laughs> right? I mean, that, 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 that is, Miss, that uh, is ludicrous. I mean, I, I hope our students, are, our university students are listening to this, and they should also be demanding holidays every time they protest. Then, 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 then I'll get a holiday. Mr. Right? So I, I just want to clarify something very quickly. If they want to protest, let them protest. Uh, Nadeem, uh, Nadeem, I just Nadeem, want to Nadeem, some Nadeem, clarify Nadeem, 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 Really with your permission, I want to pose a question to uh, Mr. Gunasekar and give you an opportunity uh, to pose a question to I'll take your uh, Mr. Varun Surya. Uh, the protest that's going to happen on the 5th of uh, March, 5th of September this year, I'm sorry for, uh, for, for that, the 5th of uh, September this year, what is your opinion? Can we at least learn a lesson? Can, can the government at least learn a lesson? You hear Mr. Tendakon and uh, Dr. Amar Surya both stating that this is going to be a show. But can the government learn at least a lesson or two from this protest that's going to happen or, on the 5th of September? To me, the question is whether the country will learn a lesson. Whether the country is going to learn a lesson. Because I feel it's not a question of victory. The country is going to lose. Not anything else. If, if I may put it this way, from day one, the joint opposition has been trying the level best to destabilize the government from day one. From day one, which I feel is very, very wrong, very, very wrong. What the president, former president, should have done was to stay away for at least three years, let the let the let the government operate, and then subsequently, if he feels that he should come in, come back. That's all. But don't you think that the government got its equation wrong because? The first instant in which the central bank bond controversy took place in February, just after a month after President Maitri Palsi Sena took over office, wasn't that the mistake? Wasn't that, that giving room for a joint opposition to be created? That wasn't was one giving, mistake. Th 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 wasn't that the reason behind all this? Uh, that was, that was one mistake. Figure. Because I, I, feel, I felt that the president could have taken action. <coughs> president could have taken action on that. But it did not happen. Very unfortunate. Mr. Gunasekar, I feel that your position there might be a little naive because you were saying earlier that the opposition should have, that the former president should have taken a back seat, should have waited three years to for see the how the government to, works it out. For the government to move forward. But you're basically asking the opposition to not do anything at a time when the government is actively working to destabilize the opposition as well. No, the question is, uh, you are referring to the... These are what oppositions do all over the world. No, this is, you are referring to the central bank fiasco. No, not just the central bank fiasco, then through... Duties of an opposition. Through, through, through what we've seen in, happening in parliament. Yeah. Uh, through what uh, Mr. Varnasuri was just talking about, the violation of the people's uh, legislative power. Uh, there is, there are problems uh, with the opposition uh, in parliament today where a majority of members who sit in the opposition are not part of the official opposition. That is a problem. So That's the correct. government was responsible for creating that problem, for destabilizing the opposition, and you're asking the opposition to not do anything and allow themselves to be destabilized. No, it's important I'm, to I'm, have an opposition I'm, I'm there and no, raise no, that No, 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 I'm referring voice. to the JO. I, don't, I still don't think that JO but it He's goes back to, again, what Dr. Amrasuri was saying before, you know, a considerable number of percentage of people, even as was evidenced in the local That's government correct. elections as well, That's voted for these JO members. Whether That's they're correct. JO or whether they're independents or whoever they are, they That's are correct. representatives of 
That's correct. My, uh, my argument is totally different. What I say is after an election, you permit a government to operate. You don't try to uh, destabilize them from day one. You don't do that. The government destabilized themselves, you would say. They didn't need the opposition to do that for them. No, maybe, maybe there were certain loopholes as well. Within, I mean, it only took a few weeks to, to tap into the central bank. But that is, that is, that is, part, that is part of a program. I, I still... The, the people responsible for the bond issue is not anybody, but the members of the public debt department. Because there is no way anybody could do anything unless the members of the public debt department were in it. I want, pose, I want, I want to get uh, the nod from uh, Mr. Tenekon because you mentioned uh, his name. Mr. Tenekon, do you agree? I, I totally disagree on this point about the central bank bond scam. I mean, this is a perpetrated fraud, you know, from the, from the top people at the very high places involved in it. They planned, they implemented it, they got people whom they chose to come into places. So therefore, all this is now uh, proved and evidenced in, in a commission report as well. We have been talking about it at that time, but that was only talk shop show. But now thereafter, it became, now it is a commission's findings. So no. therefore, I mean, you no, can't... No, no, no. I agree with uh, Mr. Tenakon. A plan was hatched, all right. That's okay. But the question is, the carrying out of the plan was done by the members of the public debt department. Nobody else. They are the only people who could have stopped it. They are the only people who could have averted it. They didn't do that. So are you That's arguing my... that you should hold those members of the public debt department right, so accountable and let the I, political I, masters go? No, no, free. no, no. No sooner that happens, the others also will fall in. So you, uh, but you must are, make are you action. Say, are you trying to say that the uh, former governor of the central bank, Arjun Mahendran, his son in also, law, the yeah, CEO, all of them are, yeah, yeah. are not involved in this? No, they are all involved. Okay. Uh, the Mr. governor himself is involved because he went to the auction room and took decisions, which, which, he, which he has no right to do. Mr. Varnasuriya, just a quick clarification on what you were saying earlier uh, regarding uh, this. It seemed to me that you were indicating that there is space within Sri Lanka's legal framework for post-enactment judicial review. I wouldn't go to the extent of post enactment judicial review because there you're talking of questioning a bill that had been made into Act of Parliament and there's clear law on that that once it's an Act of Parliament, our constitution doesn't permit that. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm speaking of is a more, let me give two examples. The judiciary would accept in two circumstances, I remember in my entire career, which now is almost 20 years, the practice four years as a student, so that's about 24 years. Uh, I remember two instances where, whilst they will, on every day, let the legislature do its job, executive do their job, and without interfering, because we believe in a separation of powers. One organ, as I said, will not interfere with the acts of another. But remember when uh, His Lordship Justice Haratsila's impeachment motion was placed in the order paper of parliament. Now, that was an act of parliament. That was the act of a speaker. But their Lordship went ahead and gave an order stopping, staying the speaker from placing it in the order paper of parliament, which can be seen in law as a legislative act. But there are the people's sovereign powers invoked. Why? Because the people went to the Supreme Court that interprets their constitution and said they are doing something unlawful there. Something unlawful. On such a situation, the Supreme Court will come down fast. Similarly, recently, remember when all of us went out, when a sitting Chief Justice was uh, unlawfully removed from a chair. The Lord, and, and they went, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who, some, some of them who had not even passed grade 8, I believe, so I wanted to sit in judgment over the judge of the uh, Supreme Court, who had uh, passed several degrees to get there. Then, once again, the Supreme Court said, well, you can certainly impeach a judge. The parliament has a right to do that. But it must be done within the four corners of the law. And if you are being unlawful, we are going to stop it. So, there are instances where, not every act of parliament, there are instances where, my example of this ruling on the opposition, in my interpretation, I have given a few statements to the press on this. In my interpretation, whilst the Honourable Speaker may very well decide on the everyday functioning of Parliament, such as uh, privilege questions, which relate to, even Parliament Privileges Act, Nadim, has two sections. Some offences can only be judged by the Supreme Court, not by the Speaker. 
Some of them, like the everyday things, can be ruled on by the speaker, which have to do with the everyday functioning of parliament. To me, this question of what is the opposition in a legislature now, in the present scenario, in my interpretation, is not something that the speaker can decide on. But my specific question is to do with the provincial council elections amendment, yes. which was, as has been accepted by members it's of parliament as well. It's an extraordinary situation because we went and argued to the Supreme Court. We took a bill, we analysed the bill, in in for days and days. Then their lordships gave a determination. Now, after that determination, if they have gone and changed the entire crux of that bill by bringing a completely new bill there, then they have gone beyond the purpose and ambit that the people have given to the parliament. That ought to, in my opinion, have been questioned. I don't know whether it was or not. That ought to have been questioned, and that's certainly something that the lord, their lordships may have, may have looked at. Why did those who brought the petitions before, uh, I, I in don't the pre, uh, before the bill was tabled in, or just after the bill was tabled in parliament during the period, those who challenged it, so if, if there was such space too, for, for the uh, justices Don't get of me the wrong, yeah, the people should misunderstand. I'm not saying that there is anything set down in the constitution that you can do it after a bill has been enacted. The draft, draft constitution, new one that we spoke of several years ago, which are now I don't know what happened to that. We had lectures also on it at your station. Right. Krishma, we can forget the fact that they hurried through it in a very decent yeah. manner. Also, can I just finish it? I don't want the, to mislead the people. The present constitution does not have post enactment judicial review. We can't. Once it's made an act and a bill has been made an act. But we have a proposal to do it in our new constitution, if and when it ever comes. The draft has it. some time ago that uh, it cost 6 million rupees to convene a sitting of parliament. So 6 million rupees for the sitting of parliament to pass the Provincial Council Elections Amendment Act, uh, 21 million rupees to the compile the report of the Delimitations Committee, another 6 million rupees for the, the sitting day. of parliament to reject said report. This is a misuse of public property. Offences under the Public Property Act? Misuse of you public funds. You think that funds. 225 MPs should be... Clearly misuse of public funds. ...should be arrested and uh, not, uh, not uh, no, be given the opportunity they, for bail? I, I fundamentally feel no. that they must understand that that commission did a job. And if they had no faith in the commission, in the first instance, they shouldn't have appointed that commission. Once you appoint a commission, you have faith in the commission. And once the report is stable, if by chance you are in a disagreement, you must mention one by one what are the areas you are not in agreement. Like the footnotes. But footnotes. Uh, Mr. Gunasekar, what I don't understand is how they can so brazenly uh, make a joke out of parliament, a 30, 34 million rupee joke out of parliament and just get away with it. You were a for former MP as well. I mean, who, who holds these people accountable? Is it the office of the Speaker or should it be the Supreme Court? There's absolutely zero accountability. Sorry, Nadine, they haven't made a joke of Parliament, they made jokes of us. No, it's very uh, simple. Mr. Tainakur. Which, may yeah. I, it's very simple. As I, as I said earlier, ethics, discipline and knowledge of governance. When you don't have all three, you are in trouble. Charles, I'll give you one country question before we go yeah. into a short uh, commercial break. Yes. Okay. Mr. Tenoko, now uh, elections are delaying. We don't know whether there will be a fresh attempt uh, on delimitation. We don't know whether that could take months, right? So uh, while all that happens on the economic front, rating agencies have listed us as one of the most vulnerable countries uh, for rising interest rates and dollar appreciation. Then we are on a negative outlook. What's going to happen in this front? Who is going to fix this side of the problem. Yeah, your contemplation about uh, this uh, commission de delimitation be being again discussed is not happening. In reality, what is going to happen is the same commission report that was rejected by the parliament will be placed before this five-member committee. That's the reality. That's the law. I don't know what else is going to happen outside the law, but from according to the act, that this five-member committee will have to consider this commission report and give their own report as to what they recommend or and about that commission report. And that once they submit that report, there is no further debating or consensus or finding opinions, getting opinions. 
they will simply uh, uh, submit it to the speaker who will send it to the president and the president will gazette it and that's law thank you remember very much. this this is the reality thank uh, you very much you thank didn't you didn't answer uh, my uh, question uh, on yeah. the economy yes. Just, about the economy yes. yeah yeah that has nothing to do with this election oh, no with this uh, with with what is contemplated about the election the method of election and how they are going to hold the election the economy is mishandled from day one <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Nakon. Uh, but very quickly, before I go in for a short commercial break, uh, I need a little bit of clarification from Mr. Gunasekara. You said that the public uh, debt department of the central bank should be held uh, fully responsible for what happened in the central bank bond controversy. Including but I, I don't governor. know. Including the governor. the governor. But I don't know whether, whether you are aware or not that uh, Deepa uh, Sidhimiratna, who was the superintendent of uh, the public debt division at that time, uh, very categorically had told the governor of the central bank that this is wrong and the governor of the central bank had instructed the person in order order do it please please use uh, the right I, uh, word <laughs> right i and, agree yeah. but the question is this there was no way that the governor could have approved that but if, without if, the public debt department let's put let's put it 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 in perspective there's no way you were the deputy governor of the uh the evil mount limits per council De deputy mayor deputy mayor of the not the of, mayor not the mayor but when the mayor tells you something yeah. would you exercise that or not no no if it is wrong i won't absolutely 30 30 if it is right 30 if it is wrong there is no way 30 illegal constructions that has nothing to do with me limits per council that has nothing to do with if by if it ever came before the council Yes, we would have all objected. And also, uh, uh, Mr. Gunasekar, I don't know whether you're aware or not, um, based on the revelations that was made here on the very same show by the former Deputy Governor of the Central Bank, W. A. J. Vardhana, it was because of uh, the members of the Public Debt Division that this really came into light. Yeah. And if not for them, the Central Bank bond controversy would have been uh, swept under the carpet. No, uh, Shamil, I want to correct you on that. I fundamentally feel that this monkey business has been going on for years. For years. Huh? Don't ever run away with the idea. Don't let anybody run away with the idea. It started only after 2015. No. Yeah. It has been happening right throughout. And who is responsible? The public debt department of this country. Very simple. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, say I, I, let you, I, I let you, I I have, let you have your own opinion about, I, I uh, have about said issues. It, I have said it. In fact, the other day, when the report was discussed with the, in the presence of the president, I asked the governor. Against your own officials. Nothing. I let you hold your opinion. Uh, Mr. Gunasekar, but uh, the story that is in the public domain is that uh, it was because of the good work done by the public debt division at that time that this in fact came to light and uh, we should all um, respect those uh, individuals who came and gave evidence before the President Commission of Inquiry and because of those reasons we've seen some, uh, some sense being made at least now in the central bank uh, as far as uh, public auctioning of uh, yeah, the to no. One, one no 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 one no may, may, may i correct you excuse me may one i correct you fundamental fact yes. that is the point where the prime minister of this country who is yes. in charge of the central bank right. affairs instructed the governor to, to change off. a system to change a system that yes. was in existence for several decades. Thank you very Sh much, gentlemen. Sh Shami, one yes. more. That I is the cause of the problem. <laughs> I want you to contest. And if such things were happening <laughs> during that time, there was no necessity for the Prime Minister to have intervened and come Sh in and introduce this new system. Shami. This new system only paved yes. the way for this. Correct. 20 seconds to you, Mr. No, then I, I, I want to correct Mr. you on this. Don't ever think that the system is okay in, as far as the public debt department is concerned. Huh? It's the same process. Why, even now, after the auction is over, they still give only the average. Right. They don't Thank give the much. highest, they don't give the lowest. Thank you very That's much. That's where they are uh, Thank you hiding much. things. Huh? Thank you very much, Mr. Bakesara Gunasekar, former member of parliament and also a member of the Devil Amount of Municipal Council. We're now going for a short commercial break. When we come back, we're talking about the country's future, where Sri Lanka heading in the next five months. Are you safe in the country as far as the country's economy is concerned? All this and more after the short commercial break. Stay connected. Stay with Face Nation.